The Ghost of Highway 20. Over two decades, four women disappeared and one was raped off the same stretch of road in rural Oregon. Their stories have other connections. One man is linked to all five crimes. This is actually on YouTube. There is a quite a long documentary on YouTube about this. And I think we're going to be doing a podcast about it as well. So um, if you're not already subscribed, please do so. And if you can, give this a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Okay, let's kick off. Kay Turner vanished 40 years ago while running along an empty road in a rustic central Oregon retreat. She was kidnapped and killed. Her remains dumped in the deep woods. Then Rachel Pickle went missing from the desolate highway compound where she lived, never to be seen again. She was only 13. It wasn't long before teenagers, Melissa Sanders and Sheila Swanson disappeared from a camping trip to the coast. Their bodies were found off a logging spur. Now it appears their killer was the same man. The breadth of the crime has never been revealed until now. John Arthur Ackroyd was a long-time state highwayman mechanic whose route along the US-20 wound through some of Oregon's most spectacular scenery from the Cascade foothills to the coast. And in the programme it does mention that he had been in the military um, when he was younger. From the outside, Ackroyd seemed to lead an ordinary life. Raised, raised sorry, in a small Oregon town, he hunted and fished, held a steady job and married a woman with a couple of young kids. But detective long suspected Ackroyd preyed on women who disappeared along the Highway 20. From the late 1970s, through to the early 1990s. They could prove only a single case. Turner's 1978 murder, the rest haunted investigators who had pursued him through the years. They were still after him when Akrai died alone in a prison cell two years ago. But by then, the original Oregon light Sorry, guys. By then, Oregon Live also was investigating Ackroyd. We interviewed key witnesses and reviewed thousands of pages of police and court records. Some of them were previously secret to hold Ackroyd accountable to give some measure of justice to the women he attacked. We went back to 1977 when Ackroyd picked up a woman from the side of the road, dragged her into the woods, raped her. The young mother managed to survive. She was the first known victim, and I think that's important to to, to realise known victim, because there are some theories that he had been doing this for a long time before this first lady um, came, went to the police. If the police had believed her, she might have been his last. It was Marlene Gaberson's first night away from her baby girl. She hadn't been out since her daughter was born, three months earlier. It was late spring. She and her husband planned to spend the night at Sister's Road, Sister's Rodeo. Marlene found a friend to care for her baby, pumped breast milk and wrote out uh, a nappy napping schedule. I thought she'd wrote out a nappy schedule then. I thought that would be really, really clever. But anyway, that day she tied her hair back, pulled on her green Levi's. She wore the bookshop boots her husband bought her, even though the couple couldn't afford them. Mummy loves you too much, she whispered to her daughter, asleep in the basinette. Be a good girl. A baby is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. 
the couple drove about 90 miles from their home in Lebanon and set up camp near the rodeo grounds. They sat around the fire drinking beer. Later that night, Marley and her husband argued when he said he wanted to head off with a couple of friends. Marlene, then 20, got up to leave. She wanted to go home to her baby. It was dark around midnight. She was looking for a ride and wandered out of the camp wandered wandered out of the campground onto Highway 20, the route that leads through the heart of sisters. Back then, little more than a dusty outpost amid pine forest in central Oregon. She returned to the campground where a stranger said his buddy, John Aykroyd, could give her a lift. Marlene had hitched, hitchhiked plenty and didn't think twice as she squeezed into the front seat between the two men. Ah, now this, unless I watched the programme wrong and didn't hear properly, I didn't realise there was two men. It was just one man on the documentary on YouTube. As the truck motored west, the men in the passenger seat wanted it, want, the man in the passenger seat wanted out. Marlene, dizzy from alcohol, watched as he reached through the open window and unlocked the door from the outside. He rolled up the window and slammed the door. Marlene glimpsed a twenty two caliber rifle on the back in the cab and a hunting knife stuck in the lid of an old coffee can near the driver's seat. She was alone with Ackroyd, a big man who reeked of sweat and freshly cut wood. A thought skittered across her mind as she drifted to sleep. The inside of the door was gone. She was trapped. Marlin was still asleep about an hour into the drive, Ackroyd turned off Highway 20 onto an old wagon road. She woke up to find his fingers squeezed tight around her legs as he dragged her into, out of the truck. He slammed the door of her head slammed into the door frame. Right, basically, I'm not going to go into details of what happened. You can use your imagination. But she was taken and she was she was sexually assaulted, and he then um, took her to um, her husband's mother, I think it was, and she had went to the hospital and there was a rape kit there and they they did what they do, and basically he. He was arrested or taken into custody. He he didn't deny anything. Um, he said that he picked her up. He said that she was drunk. He said that she had instigated the um, she sexually she was she approached him basically, and it was it was all on her, and the police basically believed him and didn't believe her. So he wasn't even charged. Didn't even, he, did, he wasn't even charged. Arkwright had told police that Marley had seduced him in front of the seat, in the front seat of his dirty truck. He said he gave her a pair of pants because she had, t had torn hers while taking them off. His mother told a detective that she peeked out of the window that night and seen Marlene in the front of, of her son's truck. She said her son was shy around women. The other man in the truck told police that Ackroyd wasn't the violent type and the woman was drunk. Investigators talked to Marlene's mother-in-law. She recalled how Marlene had arrived at the house sobbing, saying something terrible had happened. She handed police a brown paper bag with clothes Marlene had worn on the night of the attack. At the hospital, an officer needed noticed scratches on her on Marlene's back 
A doctor identified bruising on her back and legs and knee. Still, police seemed sceptical. Marlene and Ackroyd agreed to be polygraphed. A couple of weeks later, Marlene sat in the back of an unmarked police car as two officers drove her to the lie detector test. They led her into a small room with a desk. An examiner asked her a series of questions. Did she tell the truth about being raped? Did she feel she had been raped? Was these questions... Was there a question she was afraid to answer? A sergeant concluded... A sergeant's conclusion went into a taped, typed report, which was placed in a file. Marlene was lying. He offered no explanation. Cops asked Ackroyd four questions. Did the girl ask you to pull over to have some fun? Yes, he said. Excuse me. Did you have a knife in your hand when you had sex? Did you tear off her bra? No, said Ackroyd. No deception was de detected. The polygraph examiner de determined. What followed likely after the path of Ackroyd's life, along with those only at least five w young women and everyone who loved them. The district attorney delivered his decision on whether to prosecute. It was a single handwritten sentence. Arkwright would face no charges. It was... I talked to Tracy about this and she was born... She was born not far from, from Oregon. Um, one of the things that the girl did say, Marlene, was that she felt because she was a Native American. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, that maybe they didn't believe her because of that fact. I don't know. That is what the lady said. Next one is a runner on the winter road. Basically, Kay um, was running. She went to a camping out and she was running and um, just just give me a second, guys. Kay Turner threw on a T-shirt, long sleeve pullover, yellow shorts, then laced up her Nikes. She stepped into the sunshine, the frosty hair heavy with the scent of ponderous pine, ponderosa pine. It was the day before Christmas. Christmas Eve, my birthday. Her Timex wristwatch read about 8.15am. She planned an eight-mile run. She'd be back in an hour. In time for breakfast. Eight miles in an hour. Um, Kay and husband Noel had joined friends on a holiday getaway to Camp Sherman. A, va a vacation and fly fishing retreat along with pristine rivers off Highway 20. With a two-room school, country stores and 200-year 200 year around residence the friends shared a meal the night before and sang carols Christmas presents Noel bought for his wife were wrapped and in the car the travellers um, and the Turners lived in Eugene where K35 had worked as a planned parenthood and then as a manager in the local public health their agency Raised in Southern Oregon, she was the only child who remained close to her parents and had recently returned from a visit. Before she left, she had slipped her father, slipped into her father's workshop in the garage, writing, Hi, Dad, I love you, Kay, in a neat curve, and left a note for him in his workroom. Earlier in the year, she'd finished a marathon, run two and a half marathons, climbed Mount Washington and three... <laughs> Sorry, guys. She'd run two and a half marathons and climbed Mount Washington 
and Three Finger Jack. I'm presuming Three Finger Jack is some kind of mountain. Um, let's just hope so. She talked about her plans to run in Camp Sherman, inviting a friend to join her that morning. The woman demur demurred. Kay headed out alone, her feet pounding a two-lane camp road, tinged red from volcanic ash. She hadn't been out long when a state highway worker named Thomas Hannah spied her running, running south along. Hannah was returning to his place in Camp Sherman after working in the night shift. He saw another highway worker driving through Camp Sherman that morning. It was John Ackroyd. By 10am, Kay hadn't returned. Noel Turner drove through Camp Sherman to look for his wife, finding no sign of her. He panicked and called the police. The memory of an infamous crime one year earlier was still fresh in central Oregon. A stranger had driven his pickup up to two young women as they slept in Klein's Falls State Park, less than an hour southwest of Camp Sherman, armed with an axe or a hatchet. He attacked women, both students, both, both were students at Yale University. They were critically wounded but survived. No one was ever charged. Now a woman had gone missing, triggering a massive search that made headlines clear to Portland. Husband fears kidnap. Turner's searchers losing hope. One read in the Oregon, Oregonian, four days later. Um, Ackroyd name emerged early on. Hannah told police he'd seen both the highway worker and the runner in Camp Sherman that morning. Ackroyd had indeed come across Kay, but he didn't go to police, even though he saw posters with her picture at the nearby sanitarian junction highway compound where he lived he mentioned that only after a pair of state police troopers approached him a couple of weeks later he was raised in sweet home a modest logging town tw um, along highway 20 he was only the, he was the only son of a office worker at the local police department and a maintenance man he was middle the middle child between two sisters. Ackroyd earned low grades in school. His high school diploma was marked special education. He was a loner, bullied and beaten by classmates. Accused of the felony, accused of felony theft as a teen, he opted to enlist in the army and was stationed in Cor Corel, Thailand and Germany where he worked as a mechanic overseas. He was investigated for selling marijuana and going AWOL. AWOL, for people that don't know, is absent without leave. He was caught trying to steal equipment and supplies. He showed signs of a disturbed mind. An acquaintance told a detective how he had once watched in horror as Ackroyd, then a young man, hacked up. Oh, I'm sorry, guys hacked up puppies using a machete saying dogs were his saying the dogs were his and nobody else could have them later Ackroyd would drive the back road shooting squirrels and cutting off their tails once home from the army he got a straight job where he earned generally positive, positive reviews those supervisors noted that Occasional laziness and frequent time off. Burly and barrel chested. I'd favoured jeans and blue work shirts from the local Sears. I don't know what that's got to do with anything. But anyway. He, his work meant long hours alone on Highway 20. The route that bisects Oregon from east to west. His stretch of it twisted through bends, logging towns. Corvallis, well, I don't know what that is, um, C-O-R-V-A-L-L-I-S, Corvallis, 
and onto the coast. Even today, parts of the road are so narrow and quiet. Quiet. The highway has the feel of a country lane. Back then, if traffic was light and his window was rolled down, Ackroyd would have heard the south, uh, the, 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 the south Sanitamium River rushing alongside the highway as he headed west out of Sweet Home. He knew how to navigate the hills and hairpin turns during winter when, he, when f f fierce storms swept through the cascades. Ackroyd knew to the dirt spurs that led off the highway into the forest. It was on one of them that he raped Marlene Gabrielissi a year before Kay Turner disappeared. Ackroyd's first statement to investigators on the Turner case was spare. He said he passed a runner. Basically, he said he passed a runner and he he didn't say anything. Then he changed his statement and he said he did pass a runner and he stopped. And he wished her happy. He wished her Merry Christmas because it was Christmas Day, and they um, exchanged they exchanged pleasantries. How are you? The weather? Blah 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 blah, and he kept changing his, his statement anyway he um the police are pretty sure that it was him um obviously he didn't he didn't um admit to it he just he just got away with it again um very very sad very very sad I do struggle with, with with things like this because it's so alien. It's so so alien. I, I can't get my head around it at all. I cannot get my head around it at all. Anyway, guys, um, I'm going to leave it here now. I just wanted to let you know that we are going to be doing a podcast on this, and Chase will be back soon. Thank you for your kind words. And I just wanted to mention to um, Diabolical Witness, I I think it's just my accent when I say Chaser. Um, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I think it's just my accent, mate, That's to be quite honest with you. Um, so, yeah. Take care. God bless. And I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.